Okay. Hi, everybody. I cannot believe I'm up here. This is so weird. Um, so I have to tell you a story. Like, it's just so, God is hilarious. So, first of all, the night before I was asked to speak, right, um, I had a dream. And I don't get dreams a lot, this is not a thing, but um, I had a dream, and in the dream my friend said to me, like, I wonder who's speaking at the women's conference? And I go, you know, I don't know, but I can't wait to find out who it is. I can't wait. And, um, you know, and she said, she said to me, she's like, would you ever consider speaking at the women's conference? I'm like, no, no way. Like, I became a social worker, not a teacher, on purpose. Like, I like very small crowds, one-on-one -on -one preferably. Even, like, the fact that I'm speaking last is a little bit of a problem because I like to talk to everybody, and I started losing my voice. So, but here, now I get to talk to you, all of you at the same time. So, anyway, so in the dream, she said to me, you know, she's like, who's going to be speaking? And I wake up that morning, and I was like, the next morning, and I was like, like, I wonder what that was about. And I was like, oh, I'm off the hook. So, like, Brian knows. The leaders know this is not my thing. God knows I'm not a speaker. It's fine. And I get to work, and um, Patty asks me to give her a call. And, like, that's not uncommon, but so she asked me to give her a call. I figured she had, like, a counseling question or, like, a children's ministry question or something. And uh, so I call her, and she's like, would you speak at the women's conference? And I was like, what? <laughs> really? Like, <laughs> it took me, it's so funny though, because at the same time, like, God started giving me a word to share with you guys, and now I, like, couldn't get up here fast enough to tell you what was going on. So, um, and it's already starting. So this is the thing. The truth is, anything that I'm really passionate about, that has, it has the power to bring me to tears, like, in an instant. Like, everything I'm passionate about. So, I'm going to try very hard. This is why I put the tissues up here, by the way. I'm actually surprised we haven't, like, cried as, like, in a women's conference, we haven't cried as much as we, we haven't cried as much as I thought we would. But, um, anyway, so, um, I'm going to do my best not to ugly cry through this message. Um, and just be vulnerable with you, because with vulnerability comes healing. And share with you something that God has been putting on my heart, and I am honored to be with these amazing women, Lisa and Melanie, who shared about faith and hope, and I get to end our day with love. So we're going to start with the love chapter of the Bible. I am sure many of you are familiar with these verses, but let's read them and soak them in. And in that, we can find the biblical definition of love. Please go to 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8. Um, this is the New International Version. Um, you'll notice um, throughout my message, I am a big fan of like getting different, ver like reading different versions of verses to see like what kinds of things pop out. So there'll be times when we're going to use different versions, and I'll and I'll explain that as we go through the different Bible verses. So let's start with First Corinthians thirteen four through eight. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Uh, I think we got it back. All right, there we go. Thank you, Roger. Um, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres, love never fails. This is quite an extensive explanation of what, God, what love is. Showing love is truly our faith in action in so many ways. Being patient, showing kindness, covering people, and extending grace when they are suffering, not keeping a record of wrongdoing. Love always protects, trusts, and hopes, and always perseveres. We are going to talk today about love. First, how accepting God's love frees us from shame and insecurity as we begin to understand how much he loves us. Second, we are going to learn how accepting God's love will give us our identity in Christ, which allows us to surrender to his will. And finally, how God's love compels us to action to love others in very practical ways. Please pray with me. God, please speak. Use me only as your mouthpiece. 
please supernaturally touch, touch the hearts of these women in this room who need to hear, experience, and know in the depths of their soul the love that you have for them. In Jesus' name, amen. Here's the thing. As much as I would like him to, God does not wait for us to be perfect in an area before he calls on us to be used by him. If we are willing, he will use us where we are at and he will do the rest. So here goes. For those of you that don't know, my name is Sharon Klein. My husband is Jeremy Klein. He is the handsome red-bearded bass player that usually hides in the corner over there, by the way. He doesn't like... Yeah. Anyway, so... Um, and so I also, by the way, have my sister, who's a bass player, who is here today playing over there. So it's so fun to do this together, I might add. So, um, yeah. So as I said, we are part of the old guard. I've been at Center Point like 17 years. I cannot believe we are that old. But anyway, so, um, so anyway, back to Jeremy. So we have two amazing children. Lizzie is seven, going on 17. She is what we call H. SM, a hug-seeking missile. If she sees a hug happening, you better believe she's going to run as fast as she can to be part of the hug. She has a radar, I'm telling you. We can, be, we can be on the first floor, and she can be in our room, and she'll come running. And if we stop hugging before she gets to you, she's going to make you hug all over again just so that she can be a part of it. And she goes, hug magnet, and then she'll run to you, and it's the sweetest thing ever. So, yeah. And then Warren is 10. His, his mind is amazing. He's like always thinking. He's such a deep thinker. He has such compassion for those that are suffering in this world, and it is an incredibly precious gift. But as a parent, it can also present challenges when it's 10 o'clock at night and you're trying to get them to bed and we can't have these deep philosophical discussions at 11 o'clock at night when I need to go to bed. We all need to go to bed. So I am also a therapist. It is with great gratitude in my heart that I can say that I'm the clinical director of Sharon Klein Counseling. I have the privilege of working with an amazing team of therapists and my husband, who is my right hand, doing everything non-clinical, the insurance stuff, all that stuff. Um, the team is amazing. Together, we are on a mission to bring Christ into the broken lives and hearts of our clients. I'm also a school social worker for Seaford School District. I've worked there for, as an elementary school social worker for 10 years, and now I'm at the high school, and uh, been there for a while, and I love all that God has called me to. Here's the thing, though. I, it is simply astounding to me that God can take someone who was once completely, completely shattered to the point where I can stand before you today and testify to the unfailing and incredible love of God. As I was thinking about what to share with you today, God gave me three points that I will walk you through. It is my prayer that you will take this message to heart, and through the Holy Spirit, God will touch you and give you what you need. Here are the three points I want to share. First, God's love frees us from shame and insecurity. Second, God's love gives us our identity in Christ that allows us to surrender to his will. And three, God's love calls us to action. First, God's love frees us from shame and insecurity. The commandment, love your neighbor as yourself, comes from the Bible and the Gospels, specifically from the teachings of Jesus. In it, the Pharise one of the Pharisees asked Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus responds in Matthew 22, 37 through 39. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. The teaching emphasizes the importance of showing love and compassion not only toward God, but also toward our fellow human beings, treating them with the same care and consideration that we would want, to, that we would want for ourselves. The Bible talks about loving others as we would love ourselves a few times. The authors assume that we will do what we can to care for ourselves. We, we take showers, we eat well, we rest, we, we give ourselves grace, we exercise, things like that. But what happens when a person struggles with loving themselves? This is something I know all too well. For years of my life, I was doing a horrible job of loving myself. Here's the thing. If you can't accept God's love for yourself, if you can't accept God's love and love yourself, how on earth can you love others? The bottom line is you can't. 
At least not well, anyway. So here's the backstory. I was born with cerebral palsy, which always made me feel awkward and unsure of myself. The fear of physical instability, fear of falling, was a constant presence, and my brain and my body just did not connect <laughs> very well. And that's just how it was. As I entered middle school, the ongoing uncertainty of how I fit in only deepened my insecurity. Most of my summers were spent recovering from surgeries rather than enjoying outdoor activities with friends or hanging out at the mall. I have so many members, memories of laying on lawn chairs while my sister was like in the sprinkler and I had this cast on and I couldn't get it wet, so I was just like itching and, and watching her play in the backyard. And uh, that was my summer most of the time. It wasn't until later that a therapist labeled my encounters at the hospital as medical trauma. That is when I realized that there was actually a, a term for it. There was a lot of emotional baggage, a lot of wondering, did I do something to deserve this? I questioned God and if he loved me, and I questioned how I could love myself. At 14, I started experiencing intense foot pain. Uh, so to get by, I would have three Advil every four hours, literally every four hours. Um, and that would just help me get through my classes and everything else. And uh, a doctor said to me, like, you can't keep doing this. You're going to have major liver damage. So I stopped doing that. And then I was in a wheelchair a lot of the time. Finally, I underwent surgery to fuse the bones in my foot together, hoping it would alleviate the pain. Unfortunately, the surgery did not take, so they performed the surgery again. It didn't really fix anything. And at that point, it was my 20-something surgery. Um, I still cannot tell you exactly how many surgeries I've had. Don't worry, there's a silver lining to all this. <laughs> um, but emotionally, it was taking a toll, compounded by all the other challenges that we were facing at, at the time. Um, in this condition, though, it was much easier for me to believe the, I, the lies that the enemy told me. I was so vulnerable. I stopped feeling God's love. I stopped loving myself. I essentially stopped eating. The devil had a field day in my mind. The thing is, if you're neglecting your own well-being, it becomes very easy for the enemy to put lies into your head and for you start to start to believe them and then ultimately hinder you from fulfilling your purpose. I lost a significant amount of weight very quickly, which resulted in me being hospitalized several times. It was an incredibly dark period of my, of my life. In spite of these challenges, I continued attending church, but I felt empty. I succumbed to the destructive whispers of the enemy, and regrettably, I found myself in a very dark place. But when I speak of it now, two things occur. First, I am so sad to think how the eating disorder was dictating my life. But second, I praise God because of the love of the Father that I can honestly say that that pain is just a part of my past and has no, no part of my, of my present now at all. And I love being able to share that with my clients. Your past does not have to dictate or label you for in any way for the rest of your life. I distinctly remember the day that things took a turn. I was in the hospital confined to the eating disorder unit watching a video on the destructive cycle of an eating disorder with the other patients. We've seen these many times. <laughs> but somehow this was different. In that moment, I felt I had a choice before me. I could either remain trapped in this endless cycle of self-sabotage and pain and pity, denying God's work within me, or I could decide to break free and start fighting. Ironically, something happened. I thought it was unchristian to be angry. Anger was not in my vocabulary. I would literally say when I was angry that I was frustrated at someone or something over and over again. We talk about love not being easily angered, but this is the one instance where anger is justified. I got angry. I got angry at the enemy for feeding me lies. I got angry for making me feel unloved. I got angry for stealing my joy and my hope. I got angry for wasting my time in pain. 
I started trusting what the Bible says about who I am and how much God loved me over the lies that were in my mind. I made a choice to make sure that God's voice was louder than the eating disorder voice, and I began to speak it over my life. There is so much power in the Word of God, but you must choose to speak it in your life. Go to Proverbs 18.21. I love the amplified version of this verse. Proverbs 18.21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it and indulge it will eat its fruit and bear the consequences of their words. Remember, you hold the power of life and death in your tongue. There is power in the word of God. There is power in what you're saying to yourself. There is power in how you talk to yourself. There is power in how you talk to your children. There is power in how you talk to yourself in front of your children. You must speak life in your situation. You must speak life over your own mind. You must speak life into your circumstances. Your words mean so much more than you realize. The moment you start recognizing the importance of speaking life into your situation is the moment you start to feel and understand that the words in the Bible are more than just words. And let's go to the Bible. You can clap. (laughs) Let's go to the Bible and see what the Bible says about love and you. One of my favorite verses, although there are so many, is Psalms 139.14. I highly recommend that you read the entire chapter, but here is my favorite part. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Did you ever stop and think what fearfully made means? This term fearfully doesn't imply being scared or afraid. Instead, it conveys awe, reverence, deep respect. The verse is expressing a gratitude and acknowledging that the psalmist recognizes the intricate and marvelous way in which you were created by God. It reflects a profound appreciation for the craftsmanship of God forming and shaping each individual, acknowledging the intricate design and purpose with which you were formed by God, the way you, daughter of the living living God, was formed. Using I statements like this can serve as powerful affirmations of your identity and worth as a beloved child of God. They can be a source of encouragement and a reminder of your significance in God's eyes. I am wonderfully made. I was chosen before the world was created. Because of God's great love, I am alive and free. I am a child of God. For God so loved me, he gave his only son. Since I believe in him, I will not die, but have eternal life. I began to choose while feeling fear to trust God's word over over my feelings because my feelings were not my reality. I started to go out with friends instead of isolate. I found a therapist. You can pick one that you like. I highly recommend being picky. I went through five before I found someone that I liked. And then it allowed me to start going through all the stuff that I needed to start working on. Little by little, through these action steps of faith, God healed me. Side note, I have a relentless praying grandma and a mother that never stopped reminding me. I knew I was going to cry at this part. (laughs) And a mother that would never stop reminding me, one day, God's going to use this. You'll see. I was so mad at her for saying that. And now she's here, able to witness the fruition of her, of her faith and those words. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for the encouragement. (laughs) Okay, so, as a therapist, I've come across countless individuals that are not doing a very good job of loving yourself. If you only knew how much you were loved, God is calling you to do things and you are getting in your own way. I began to fight back with God's word. And for those of you in this room that need to hear this, 
I want to remind you of who you are because of who God is. God loves you so much, it's bananas. <laughs> Start speaking these verses over your life. Memorize them. Let them become ingrained in your mind. Patty gave each of you these verse, some of these verses in a gift bag. I want you to pick your favorites and memorize them and ingrain them in your heart and go and find some more. Okay? Do you know that by doing something over and over again, you are literally creating neural pathways in your brain? This works both ways. This is why people that are very negative often find it very easy to continue being very negative because it is literally ingrained in them to do so. Allow the word of God to create new neural pathways in your brain to make it easier and easier to embrace the truth of God's word in your mind and in your heart. Remember, God's love frees us from shame and insecurity. And God's love, God's love gives us our identity in Christ that allows us to surrender to his will. Let's go to 1 John 3, the NIV version. I now love 1 John 3. <laughs> See what great love the Father has lavished on us so that we should be called children of God, and this is what we are. Lavished on us? God loves us so much. We are his children. Parents, is there not anything that you would do for your children? Think about it. That's how God feels about us and more. Wow. In fact, he loved us so much he died for us so that we could have a relationship with him forever. That is truly the most powerful example of love. If God will die for you, you can trust him with your life and live for him and surrender. Please turn to Jeremiah 29, 11, which I turned into an I statement. I trust that God has a purposeful plan for my life filled with hope and a bright future. He is a good, good father who will take our lives and transform them with his redemptive love, just as Lisa and Melanie shared in their testimony. As I mentioned earlier, I run a psychotherapy practice called Sharing Client Counseling. Fra frankly, I named it that because at the time I couldn't think of anything else better to call it. On a side note, if you have suggestions, I am very open. <laughs> so I'm not kidding. Like, you can text me. Call, like, please tell me. Um, when I was sharing this with Brian, Brian suggested that I name it after him, the practice after him. <laughs> but here's the thing. Like, then people would call me and ask him to be their therapist. And like, Sarah's all, already this amazing therapist in their family. They don't need more than one. And I'm pretty, cons pretty, pretty sure that Pastor Brian has a lot on his plate. So that's not happening. <laughs> Initially, when I started the practice, my intention for, was, it, was that it would be the small side gig um, but that would generate enough income to cover childcare and allow me to continue doing the work that I love. And that's what it was, small side game. Then when God began leading me in a new direction and I, there was so much need and I just put on my heart that I should hire someone to come alongside me. But at that time, I also found out I was having more major surgery, so I put that on hold, so we didn't do that. Shortly after the surgery, Samantha Furman <laughs> who was in this room, asked me if I'd be willing to supervise her. And when she asked me, I figured, sure, like, I, I mean, I love Samantha. That was an easy thing to say yes to, but I figured it would just be like signing paperwork and meeting once in a while. No, in New York State, in order to do that, you have to legally hire someone in the same company that the supervisor is working. So I, she became my first employee, and we worked together. Um, and I quickly became familiar with group practice laws and all that stuff. Slowly but surely, after Sam, God has brought together an incredible team of people who joined the practice to integrate faith and mental health. Now we are a team of 10 people, and all I can say is, thank you, God. Using me, even in my fear, and everything else they had to work through. I, trust each nudge, I trusted each nudge from God, and it made me have the faith for my future, surrendering to him in whatever the, he wanted the practice to be. One of my clients gave me a picture. It hangs in my office. It says, faith until you make it, and that's exactly what we've done. God has a will for your life. Are you seeking his will for your life and pursuing it in faith? Some of you use this, don't you? <laughs> Romans 12, 2. 
I love the English Standard Version of this verse because it reiterates how we need to test God's will. We don't always know it right away. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Many of you in this room I have spoken to. I know you're struggling with decisions, what God wants next for your life. Quite frankly, a lot of times God's will for our life is not blatantly obvious. We wish it could be, right? I've, I've often literally asked God to write it in the sky or for a leader from church to like, you know, speak over me. I'd like find a leader and be like, okay, I'm ready for God to like speak through the person and tell me what I need to do next. Sometimes he does that. But more often than not, he's asking you to trust him and listen to his still, small voice. And it is a still, small voice. Often, God requires small steps of faith, trusting him and resting in his love. Recently, my husband and I sought guidance from a business coach for our counseling practice. His advice was straightforward. Take a leap, leave your current job, and wholeheartedly pursue the practice. Let it flourish. While his suggestion was encouraging, our journey thus far had been marked by a different pattern. Typically, it would begin by God impressing something on my heart, followed by his confirmation in various ways, sometimes very obvious. Each step forward has been taken by a mix of trust and caution, always trying to stay within God's will. There have been times when God's prompting was so evident I couldn't ignore it, and other times where I needed to take a step and just see what would happen next. After the meeting, I wrestled with what, God, what this man said, fearing it was not from God, and that I was missing something crucial, though, that God might want for our family, because his advice was not what I had been hearing. I turned to two of my closest friends, who I meet with regularly and pray over WhatsApp. One is in Germany and the other is in Florida. Cool that technology can do that, right? <laughs> it's funny now because honestly, like most of my social life is like done through WhatsApp and like Marco Polo and my prayer life and everything. It's all <laughs> technology. Anyway, um, in any case, my friends offered me a perspective that brought me peace. They reminded me that I'm already walking in faith, listening to God and taking step in, steps in the direction that he wants me to go. What more do I need? In fact, if I knew the big picture, they said, I might run from it feeling inadequate to handle it. And you know what? I think they're right. They encouraged me to trust God and that he would reveal what I needed to know in his own time, in his own way. Their words reminded me that walking in faith is enough. I don't need the entire picture. I just need to trust God's purpose for my life and for the business. He will guide us each step of the way, revealing his plan on a need-to-know basis. Some of you are frozen in your tracks because you want to know all the pieces and how all of them will fit in. Any type A personalities in here? <laughs> That's me. <laughs> because, of the, because of that, some of you have been waiting years to do whatever it is that God is calling you to do. And there is a fire burning in your soul to do something, but you pretend it's not there. I can't tell you whether or not what you're feeling from God is right, but I will tell you that God requires that you take the first step and he will meet you where you're at and he will help guide you the rest of the way. The world is waiting. First, we must accept God's love, which frees us from shame and insecurity. Then the love of God gives us our identity in Christ that allows us to surrender to his will. And finally, God's love calls us to action. So, what does loving others look like? Remember 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8? Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It, is not, it does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not in, delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Love in action is making decisions that, show, that will show love to others in various ways. Giving people the benefit of the doubt because we are all fighting our own battles and you might have no idea the battle that the person next to you is experiencing. While I was in a dark place that that eating disorder had brought me to, 
I was not the best person to be around. <laughs> I was moody, I was selfish, I was so deeply sad, I was inconsiderate. My friends were patient with me though, and I will never forget my best friend literally walking in circles with me around the Roosevelt Field food court one night when I was trying, like so patient, as I was trying to figure out something that I could eat. She didn't yell at me, she didn't get frustrated at me, although honestly she had every right to. And she just stayed with me and encouraged me until I was able to make a decision. I want you to ask God to help you if you cannot feel love for someone in a particular situation. I have so many instances where God will supernaturally do that if you just ask him. Now, I'm not encouraging you to love others to the point of hurting yourself or neglecting your responsibilities or your family, work, etc. Boundaries are, are real. <laughs> It comes back to listening to God's voice and obeying his prompting. You will know when it's him. 1 John 3, 17 through 18. I love the message version of this verse. If you see some brother or sister in need and have the means to do something about it, but turn a cold shoulder and do nothing, what happens to God's love? It disappears, and you made it disappear. My dear children, let us not talk about love. Let us practice real love. A, a need could be something as simple and small as a hug or as big as lending your home. Whatever it is that God is calling you to do, do it. You must rise up and do it. Walk in your calling. Side note, you don't have to be altogether lovely to do this either. So... If God is tell, like God does not wait for us to be like have arrived before He wants to use us. That's not usually how it how it works. Let me tell you one last story. I love this story. Okay, years ago, back in the throes of the eating disorder, in the midst of my depression, one night I was alone in my room. I don't even think I ever told you this, Mom. I was like, <laughs> I can't just sit here wallowing in my sadness. Can't do that. So, I got dressed. The sun was about to set, but I told myself, before it gets too dark, I'm going to go to CVS. It was like really close down the street from my house. And before I going to bed that night, I was going to invite one person to church. I get to CVS. Hold on, I got to take a drink. <laughs> ah, okay. So I get to CVS. Mind you, I didn't have a track. I didn't have any information with the church, like I didn't have a piece of paper with the church information on it. I didn't even have a pen. And so, you know, if God is asking me to do something, you'd think I would have been more prepared. Like, I should have done something about that, but I didn't. In any case, in any case, eventually I felt a prompting from the Holy Spirit to invite a young woman to church. She looked like she worked there. I think at the time she was in the shampoo aisle. Um, she did not seem that interested, to be honest, but she offered to take down my number. So I was like, all right, I did what I had to do. So she took down my number on this tiny, tiny piece of paper and put it in her wallet. I go home. That's it. That's it. Much later, so much later that the church I had originally invited her to, I was no longer going to. <laughs> okay. I actually talked to... I, I'm, let me just keep going. Oh. Anyway, so, um, so I get this random call one day. She says, hi, my name is Marissa. I'm looking for a church, and my best friend has been carrying around your number in her wallet for a very long time. She told me you invited her to church at CVS a while ago. Well, I'd like to go. She came to Centerpoint, joined a life group, and became one of my dear friends and colleagues. We actually work together. Her name is Marissa Hammock. She is a counselor on our counselor list, by the way. And the rest is history. So you don't have to have it all figured out before God will use you to show his love to others. He will use you in whatever form you are in as long as you are willing. Side note, if you want to cure depression, one of the best ways is to actively serve and help others. As you go out to be a vessel of hope to others, he will give you hope. I promise you. 
you must rise up. Let his love compel you to do it afraid. Invite someone to church. Pray over someone. Go back to school. Start a life group. Go to a life group. See a therapist. Forgive. Lay down your pride and fight for your marriage. Pray. People need you to move to action. You can't begin to show his love if you choose to stay still. Let, start small and let God do the rest. I want to leave you with this. Ephesians 3.20, New Living Translation. Now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Remember, God's love frees us from shame and insecurity. God's love gives us our identity in Christ that allows us to surrender to his will. And God's love calls us to action. Pray with me, please. God, thank you for, for your freely given, incomprehensible, unearned love that you have shown us. Please help us to release our shame and insecurity and find our hope and peace in you. Please give us the courage to walk in your will. Give us the courage to act and bring your love to those around us, even if we feel inadequate. Thank you for loving us so much that you sent your son to die for us so that we could be forever with you. We love you. As we go about our day, please give these women a renewed sense of how precious they are in you and the courage to walk in faith and do your will. Thank you.